Chapter One, The Dream. It was late and Eden was tucked in bed. He was having trouble going to sleep. Tomorrow, he was going to spend a day with Granddad. Finally, sleep came upon him, and it was not long before he drifted into a dream. It was not a nice dream and one that would trouble him later when he awoke. He was dreaming that his Granddad was not with him. Granddad had died, and he would not be able to see him anymore. It made him cry in his sleep, enough that he awoke still sobbing. Ethan was seven and three quarters old. When asked his age, he would never forget the three quarters part. And because his parents both worked, he spent many happy times with Granddad. He could share problems with him, and in some ways, he was more like a very dear friend. The thought of Granddad dying was too sad to think about. Granddad was old, but not that old, he thought. So he got up quickly and went to his parents' bed and told them about his dream. I just had a terrible dream and I can't get back to sleep, he sobbed while wiping his eyes. What was it about? asked his mom. I dreamed that Granddad had died, he replied. His mother comforted him and assured him that Granddad was fine. Feeling a little better after his talk with Mom, he went back to his bed and finally fell into a more peaceful and less troubled sleep. Morning finally came, but the dream was still playing in his mind. When he arrived at Granddad's in his mom's car, Granddad heard the car pull up and walked out to meet them at the gate. Good morning, he said as he kissed Ethan's mom through the open window and then came around the car to where Ethan was struggling to get all his clothes and belongings he needed for his visit. Can I help, son? he said. Ethan looked at him and felt so much better to see that Granddad was still in the land of the living and healthy. No, I'm okay, said Ethan with his arms full while struggling to carry it all. You see, if you can carry it all, you must be quite strong and grown up, Ethan thought as he pushed the car door open with his foot. This was the sort of thing that Ethan liked to show Granddad, and as it turned out, he really could not carry all of it at once. First, he dropped one of the Wellington boots. Then, as he bent over to pick up the Wellington boot, his old jeans slipped off the top of the box he had packed. Feeling a bit frustrated, he started to kick the jeans up the path towards the door so that he would not have to ask for help. Granddad let him, knowing that it was important for Ethan to do this by himself. In the end, Ethan had another idea. I will carry the rest of the stuff in the house and then come back and get the jeans, he thought. Granddad smiled from the doorway and said, Now that's using your head, nutter, letting Ethan realize that in this situation it was the smartest thing to do, and also that he was a nutter because he should have let Granddad help in the first place. Nutter was a favorite word that Granddad used for Ethan when he did a crazy thing. Bacon, eggs, toast, and beans, just what the doctor ordered, Granddad said as he placed the breakfast that Grandma made onto the table. You've got a lot of work to do today, my old mate, he said to Ethan, so eat up. Ethan's mom soon finished her breakfast, and as she stood up, she said to Ethan, Now you be good today, I will pick you up this evening when I finish work. Ethan's mom was a hairdresser and would sometimes have to work on Saturdays like this one. She bent over and kissed Grandmom on the head, then Granddad. Ethan made it a point in his mind that the next time he kissed Granddad and Grandmom goodbye, it would be on top of the head. Grandma cleared the dishes as Ethan and Granddad made their way to the garden. Nice sort of day for working in the garden, ain't it, mate? Granddad said. Granddad would use the name mate when they were alone together and it made Ethan feel good. Now, Granddad's garden was not the biggest in the world, but it was big enough to keep the pair busy whenever the weather was fine enough to work outside. When the weather was not, they would work in the shed and get the tools and seeds ready to use in the garden when it turned nice. Ethan walked beside Granddad as they made their way to the shed and at the same time received instructions as to what was going to be his job that day. See them beans growing over there? Granddad said, pointing to several neat rows of beans. I will love you forever if you could get rid of those weeds and remove any stones you might find. Granddad would always use the saying, I will love you forever, when he wanted you to do something for him. Ethan knew Granddad would love him even if he didn't pick all the weeds from the bean patch. It was that word forever that made Ethan start thinking about the dream he had had last night. 
He wished that he would always have everyone he loved forever. It made him sad to think about the possibility that he might not have Granddad forever. Granddad had a lot of answers for many things, but Ethan did not want to tell him what he was thinking. He did not want to upset Granddad by telling him that he dreamed he had died. They reached the shed, and Ethan put the bravest face he could and smiled as he walked in, and Granddad walked over to the bench where he passed Ethan a trowel. That would be his tool to help remove those pesky weeds. Granddad's shed had its own smell. Ethan noticed it was a cross between old potato sacks, onions that are drying, and earth. It was sort of sweet in a funny way. The shed was full of everything you would ever need. Tools neatly stacked, boxes of screws and nails, along with the sharpest knives you could imagine. If it's the sort of day when you can't work in the garden, then knife sharpening was one of the first jobs. The pocket knife Granddad carried in his pocket was so sharp that if you touched the blade of it with your thumb, your leg would drop off. Or at least that's what Granddad had told him. Weeds, where do they come from? The more you pick, the more they grow. That much I understand, thought Ethan. But it's the same with stones, and they don't even grow. You can spend a day picking stones up from a piece of ground, not leaving a one. Only for the next time you come back to the same bit of ground, they are back. Was Granddad playing tricks on him? Did he keep putting the stones back? Surely not. He loves his garden, and the thought of him putting stones on the ground for Ethan to pick up made no sense. Ethan stood watching Granddad as he first picked up a fork, then put it down then picked up a shovel and put it down, then picked up the fork again. What are you going to do, Granddad? I'm going to start digging out those Brussels sprouts, he replied. All that's left of them is the stalks. They look ugly and it's time to get rid of them. Did you eat any of them? Oh, yes, Ethan said, and they were good. There is something about vegetables that are grown by Granddad. They taste so much better than stuff from the stores. Well, time to get to work, Granddad said as he held the door open for them both to start their separate jobs. Ethan thought the best way to go about his task would be to get rid of the weeds and then start on the collection of stones. After about an hour, most of the weeds had been pulled and Ethan thought that it would be a good time to take them to the compost heap and rest his back. At the same time, he could see how Granddad was getting on with his digging. What are you doing? asked Granddad. I'm taking this lot of weeds to the compost heap, Ethan replied as he stood with both arms full of weeds. Why don't you get the wheelbarrow, said Granddad. Ethan Ethan looked at him, saying he did not need it as some of the weeds fell back to the ground. He did manage to get most of them to the compost heap and place them on top of the pile. As he walked back towards Granddad, he clapped his hands to remove some of the dirt and then just stood and watched as Granddad continued to dig. The clapping of Ethan's hands attracted Granddad's attention. He could see that something was bothering him. What's up, mate? You don't look your happy little self. I, um, I, um, Ethan hesitated, thinking whether or not he should tell Granddad about the dream. I had a terrible dream last night, and I did not sleep too good. It just popped out of his mouth, and he knew what the next question would be. Well, what was it about? Granddad inquired. Come on, spit it out. It was only a dream. I, uh, dreamed that you died, Ethan blurted. Granddad grinned. You know, when I was your age, I used to dream the same thing about my granddad. Ethan asked the next question, hoping it would make him feel better. And what happened to your granddad? Granddad looked at Ethan. Well, he died. But he was very old when he passed away. I'm still as strong as a bull, and I'm not ready to start pushing up the daisies yet. Come here, he said, as he held his hand out to hold Ethan's. Let me show you a story. Now, to be shown a story by Granddad was far better than being told one. They walked over to where the lettuce was growing. He was looking for a sign. And when he could see what he was looking for, he got down on his knees and instructed Ethan to sit beside him. Folding back one of the lettuces, the story began that Ethan would never forget and only wish you could have been there with him to share in it and hear the way his Granddad could tell it. Granddad's big hand carefully pointed out the different parts of the leaf, and Ethan was introduced to the caterpillars. The caterpillar's life was pretty simple, really, but there were a few necessities. Eat as much as you can when you could. In fact, most of the day was spent finding something to eat. 
Keeping warm was also a necessity, but it provided lots of pleasure. A caterpillar with a full stomach would place its full belly next to the underleaf that was warmed by the sun on the other side. This was something they enjoyed and wasted many hours doing, especially the lazy ones. Sugar crystals were not necessary, and they had no practical use whatsoever, but they did show one's wealth. The more you had, the more prosperous you were. The caterpillars would lie warm in their tummies against the underleaf and watching the light reflect through the crystals. Many an hour was spent just staring and dreaming. It made them feel good to have a nice pile of crystals polished for all to see. It made them feel important. Granddad had names for the different caterpillars. The caterpillar, caterpillars that were pointed out by Granddad were Charlie, Harry, and John. They were three totally different caterpillars with three totally different personalities. Chapter 2 Charlie, Harry, and John Charlie was definitely the biggest caterpillar. He had a large mustache and a smiling face that would make most people not notice that he had one leg missing. He also had a rather large collection of crystals and had lost his leg a long time ago in a fight. When he was young, he had ventured too near the edge, despite warnings from the others, and lost the leg in a life and death struggle. He would describe the thing that he fought, but no one really believed that anything could be that mean. It was supposed to have at least eight legs and as many eyes. It was a story that dear Charlie never tired of telling. From the day he came back with his leg missing, he was a hero. Many people wanted to hear his story, and by now, many people had. The evil predator had grown in size and meanness, and Charlie would insist that he was still living near the edge. That was another reason why the younger ones never ventured far from the community. Charlie had mellowed with age. He could be grumpy sometimes, and when asked what was wrong, he would say that his old wound was acting up and he just wanted to be left alone. However, he was the one to go to with a problem. He seemed always to have the answers and would enjoy guiding and making suggestions. John was known as the Traveler. He had longer hair than the others and worn shoes. He was a lot younger than Charlie or Harry and did not care about crystals. They made no sense to him at all. He would often wonder why the other caterpillars would spend so much time just staring at them. It was as if the crystals had a secret power over the caterpillars. As for warming his belly, he considered this a total waste of time. If you're cold, walk and get warm, he would say. What he loved more than anything was to travel. He had a small bag that would hang on his side, and that was his only possession. He was loved by all, but Harry was convinced that he would amount to nothing, as he did not even possess one crystal. Harry liked him enough that he would continually instruct poor John in the matter of caterpillar wealth and how important appearances were. John respected and liked Larry enough that he would listen. Charlie was a different story. John would spend many hours just listening to Charlie's tales about his adventures and travels. Even when Charlie had finished, John would ask him to tell certain bits again and question him about other parts of the stories. John also knew when and when not to bother Charlie with questions and advice. In fact, before John would approach him, he would hide behind a ridge in the leaf and make sure that Charlie was up to his planned visit. So John was very perceptive of Charlie's moods. Charlie loved John, and John loved Charlie. Careful Harry was almost as old as Charlie was, but he had lived his life according to the rules. He had no interest in the edge, and the thought of John not having any interest in crystals was beyond his understanding. Crystals? Show standing, he would tell John. He would love to say the same thing to Charlie, but he knew that would be unwise, and because he was careful, he said nothing. Now, Charlie liked Harry, but sometimes he would have to tell him his wound was hurting, so he would leave. Most of the things that Harry would worry about, you cannot do anything to change. 
Therefore, Charlie did not feel like thinking about or commenting upon them. Harry, on the other hand, did have considerable girth and possessed maybe the largest collection of crystals in the underleaf. He would get many hours of pleasure from advising the younger caterpillars on life's matters. Both his hands would play with his small pencil mustache and he would close his eyes as he would say the word crystals, whistling and lisping the S's. Crystals. John found this amusing and would want to laugh, but because of his respect for Harry, he would hold the laughter in. So all things being considered, Harry was someone that you would look up to and you could call a caring caterpillar. Granddad's big hand carefully pointed out the different parts of the leaf. That was the caterpillar's world. First, you've got to realize that to a caterpillar, up is down, and they live on the bottom of the leaf. Also, the edge of the leaf is a very dangerous place for a caterpillar to go, as birds and other dangerous things live on the other side of the leaf that would love to eat a juicy caterpillar. It was a well-known fact on the underleaf by all caterpillars that you did not go to the edge. Remember what happened to Charlie? The elders would say, very, very dangerous. Two things that would scare a caterpillar were the edge and the change. Now, the edge you could keep clear of, but the change would get everyone in time. When the change came, it was final. The caterpillars would just go to the darker part of the lower leaf, never to be seen again. When a caterpillar felt the change coming, you could see it in them. They would become large and slow. They would not mix with the others and would spend longer periods of time just looking at the crystals and warming themselves. They no longer seem to care about the community of the underleaf. Even the loudest and most verbal caterpillars would go quietly at the approach of the change. In the end, only the crystals and the warmth had any value. The desire to eat would be quelled by the onset of an urge few understood. The others would say, poor thing, that's too much suffering. One day you would wake up and they would be gone. No one would touch the crystals of those that were taken by the change. They would be left alone by the others just in case they decided to come back. They never did. The change must be very serious for a caterpillar would never dream of leaving its crystals. In the end, the change would get them all. Granddad pointed out that the change was the only definite thing in a caterpillar's life. It could not be stopped. Rumors had it that some of the caterpillars had journeyed to the darker part of the leaf before and returned, but not in recent times. It was dark and very scary. Not particularly dangerous, but very, very scary. Chapter 3, John's First Journey This particular day, Grandad explained, started much the same as any would. Harry was down to, at the eastern patch, chewing and trying to talk to those that would listen. He had heard rumors that one of the youngers had found a crystal that was definitely worth pursuing. Nice day, nice day, he would say as he grazed his way towards the group that had gathered at one end. He tried hard to not look. He did not want to show too much interest in the crystal the group had gathered around, as this would not be prudent. The last thing he wanted to do was to show any envy towards the possessions of a younger caterpillar. Slowly, he nudged through the group and clearly could see the colors that the crystal was reflecting long before the crystal itself came into view. The group started to part as he pushed his oversized shoulders between two of the gathering. Secretly, he was amazed. It had been a long time since a crystal of this size had been found. In his mind, the words were formed that he would never say. Where did you get it? Can I have it? Please, please let me have it. You know I would love it and polish it and look after it better than anyone else, he thought. But the words that actually came out of his mouth were, oh, that's not bad. The younger caterpillar, Tim, was surprised at first by the whistling speech of Harry, and also by the fact that Harry paid such a compliment to his crystal. Yes, it's very lovely, isn't it? 
I was so lucky to get it, said the younger caterpillar. Harry pretended a lack of interest and was looking down at his hands as if cleaning his nails and said, And where did you find it? Oh, sir, I did not find it. I swapped it with John the Traveler, Tim said. Swapped it? Swapped it? What on earth could you have had of such value that you could have swapped it for that crystal, said Harry. I had some spare shoe leaf, not much, but enough to repair at least two shoes, Tim replied. John had repaired two of his shoes and was just testing them to see how they felt, flexing them and stamping them. He could see the interest the crystal had caused and was glad that he did not have to bother. Mm, they feel good, he thought. Picking up his bag that he had earlier carefully packed, he started out. What a great day for a journey, he thought. The excitement of a journey made his concentration lapse. He was very much aware of the dangers he might face, but with some proper planning and the vitals he packed, he was quite confident he could do it. The thought of what he might find went through his mind. Was Charlie's monster as bad as he had portrayed? Well, there was only one way to find out, he thought. Harry slipped quietly away from the crowd. Where was that John, he thought. It was very important for Harry to get as much information as he could from John as quickly as possible. He must explain to John how important it was to keep secret the location of the crystals. If knowledge of the location of the crystals should go any further than John and Harry, it would potentially spoil the value and diminish the status of his, oops, he meant to think, THE crystals. As he approached where John was last seen, he was disappointed to see that John was not there. Blast, he thought, I must find him. He needs my advice. He shouted, John, John, John. He shouted to the front, John. Then he shouted to the left, John. He was starting to think he was out of luck. The last shout confirmed it. John! He almost screamed. Humbug and humbug, what shall I do now, he thought. He retraced his tracks back towards young Tim and the wonderful crystal that should really have been his. I wonder if Tim would trade me, he thought. I'm sure I could get some hold of some thick leaf. I would offer him twice the amount he gave John. And if he pushed, three times the amount. And if he really pushed, I would give him as much of the stupid stuff that he wanted. I could even offer to buy him a complete set of shoes. That's a lot of shoes on a caterpillar. Charlie was lazy, not the sort of thing he liked others to see. But to be honest, he thought, I don't care. The warmth on the leaf was seeping deep into his old skin and it felt so good. The light was amazingly brilliant today, and he was able to see all the colors in the crystals. The colors were deep and very separated. They would move and change and produce patterns that were so unique, Charlie was just mesmerized by them. He was so at peace with himself that time just slipped by. People could see it in him, and he could feel it in himself. It was the beginning of the change. But Charlie was too comfortable and engrossed in the colors to even let it bother him. John was very pleased with the progress he had made. He did notice, however, that one of the shoes he had repaired was rubbing slightly. Not enough to bother him at this time, but something he would become, that would become more aggravating the further he got into his journey. At this time, it was not too much of a problem. Before long, he was into parts of the leaf he had never traveled to. Well, this has been easy. I hope the edge is more exciting, he said to himself. He had noticed that the leaf had become drier and more wrinkled. As he proceeded, the wrinkles in the leaf became more taxing than what he was used to walking on. But the more wrinkled it became, the more he enjoyed it. When he was at the top of a wrinkle, he could see a lot farther than when he was back home. As he approached the lower parts of the wrinkle, the shade would cool his body. It was quite strange, he thought. Sweat up, cool down, sweat up, cool down, sweat up cool down. He progressed determinedly towards his goal. Harry arrived back at the group that was still looking at Tim's crystal. Anyone seen John, he said. They all looked blank, surprised that Harry had returned. Again, he repeated himself, hello, has anyone seen John? 
Tim stepped forward and said that he had not seen him since he swapped the leaf for the crystal. The mention of it again raised Harry's temper. temper. Well, did he say where he was going or what his plans were? He played with his mustache as he glared at Tim. Not really, Tim said. Explain yourself, boy, Harry snapped. Well, he did mention that when he fixed his shoes that he might, and he did say might, take a trip to the edge, replied Tim. The edge? My goodness, you don't just take a trip to the edge. It's dangerous. We might never see him again. He could disappear with the knowledge of where he found the, um... He stopped himself from finishing the sentence and just said, Well, it's very foolish. Now all you young ones have wasted enough time looking at that crystal and doing nothing. It's very important that you eat, so go and eat. Tim, when I have sorted this mess out, you and me need to have a talk. You need help and I am prepared to take time out of my busy schedule to assist you. The last thing you need to be doing at your age is cleaning crystals. You need to eat, my boy. Now off with you. Tim turned and walked away. Harry waited whilst the rest of them went left. When alone with the crystal, he approached it and whispered to it, You're mine. All mine, he said quietly, too, so no one would hear. I will go and see Charlie, he thought. He might have some more information, or he might not know anything at all. Quickly, he dragged his large body towards Charlie's patch. Charlie was staring deep into the deepest purple he had seen reflected by the crystal for a long time when he first noticed it. Was it a blemish that needed polishing? He focused his stare, and before his eyes, the image grew. Blast and blast again, he thought. It's Harry. The approaching of Harry's Harry cast a shadow on Charlie's crystals and stopped the reflections that were giving Charlie so much pleasure. Charlie, Harry called. Charlie didn't answer. He repeated himself, Charlie! Finally, Charlie answered, What? As he peered around the edge of his crystal heap towards the direction Harry was approaching from. Nice stay, isn't it? Harry said nervously. He realized he had disturbed Charlie and was normally... He wouldn't dream of disturbing him, but this was very important. Well, it was a nice day until someone decided they had to ruin it for me, said Charlie. Oh, I would not normally have dreamed of bothering you, but this is very important, said Harry. What? Charlie said. Harry, slightly confused by the lack of interest Charlie was showing, had to plan what he was going to say next. He wanted to tell Charlie about the crystal. John swapped with him. But Harry realized that Charlie was quite content with the amount of personal crystals he owned. He needed something a bit spicier to hold his interest in the first instance. And then he would turn the conversation towards the crystal once he had gained Charlie's interest. It's the monster, he blurted. The monster, Harry said the second time. What blasted monster, said Charlie. The same one that got your leg. This made Charlie stop walking. And then he said, where is it? Oh, it's not here, Harry said weakly. Well, where the heck is it, Charlie asked. No, no, my dear friend, you misunderstand me. Charlie might be in danger of being eaten by the monster, Harry said, realizing that he had gained Charlie's interest. Charlie realized that he had been trapped into a conversation that he really was not interested in. How have you concluded that John is in mortal danger, Charlie said. He's gone to the edge. Harry said, when? Not only that, he has been doing really strange things, said Harry. When? Charlie again said in a low, very serious voice. It was just after he had swapped my crystal with Tim, Harry said immediately wishing he had not. Charlie approached closer to Harry until their whiskers were very near touching. Now, Harry, I want to know how John happened to be trading your crystals and when. And you had better give me some straight answers. Harry slowly eased backwards, creating more space between him and Charlie. Well, the crystal was not mine when, he, when John swapped it. You could almost see the tension ease from Charlie's face as the truth whistled its way out of Harry's lips. I meant to say that it would be mine. Okay, okay, enough, said Charlie. I'm not really interested in the crystal. I am more interested at what time did anyone last see John? Well, it was 
this morning, about halfway to lunch, just before breakfast. Harry was measuring time between the moment he woke up and his next meal. Hmm, Charlie exclaimed, thinking, his stump slowly rocking backwards and forwards as he estimated how far John might be. I don't think any of us will be able to stop him. He's too fit. I've watched him walk as fast as the best of the young ones can run. He just does not seem to tire. By now, he will be approaching areas of danger that only his fitness and intellect will be able to protect him. It would be far too dangerous to send anyone in to bring him back. Charlie realized that there was not anything he could do to help John. He told Harry that he wanted to rest. The thought of John heading to the edge had upset him and brought back memories that he would prefer to forget. Also, it had made his wound hurt, start to hurt. Time for you to go, Harry. I need to rest, he said. No, Harry said. You've got to let me tell you about my, I mean, the crystal. It's enormous. Clear as a bell. Beautiful, Charlie interrupted Harry's flow. I'm not interested in the crystal, so please will you leave me alone, asked Charlie. Harry turned and started to slowly move away. Looking back, he said, it's so clear. The colors reflect many times further than its sight. It's beautiful, beautiful. Charlie flopped back down in front of his crystals where he had been before Harry had arrived, but he could not get the same level of comfort or enjoyment he was experiencing earlier. His mind was in other places.